The really hard person says, do you want to fight in a thousand different ways? The important thing to remember is that the cue to fight need not fit in at all with the situation. Number one, in an orthodox Muslim country. Phew, it is hot, yeah. Did you spill my pint? <laughs> Number two, at a meeting with Prince Charles. Prince Charles, I can't agree with your views on architecture. Are you saying my mother does it for money? <laughs> Number three, at a Stevie Wonder concert. Oi, are you looking at me? Hard people have certain accoutrements to go with their hardness. And if you have one of these but are not hard, you can get into trouble. For example, if you have the wrong sort of haircut. Oi, mate! Skinhead! Skinhead! Oh dear, must be more windy than I thought. <laughs> now, what are you going to sing for us? Of course, hardness in males is not confined to human beings. And the extraordinary thing about conflicts like this between two male moose is that they will involve the communication of very definite messages. <laughs> that snort there, for example, means very specifically, are you calling me a puff? <laughs> and that tilt of the head in response translates as, yeah, I am. Sorry, I didn't quite catch the name. John Inman, isn't it? <laughs> It is, of course, the male with the biggest antlers who is assumed to be the most sexually successful male within the community. Uh, the primary feature of the hard person is that he does not run from not nobody. Of course, this means the British, although crap at sport, are always foremost in hardness. And here at the Olympic Games 100 metres finals, the contestants are on their starting box and they're off. Every single one of them, except for the British contestant, you can't see him, but he's standing still and shouting, Come back, you shitters! What a marvellous performance, demonstrating to the watching world that the British do not lose their bottle just because someone's got a pistol. And now over to the fencing, where the British fencer is not wearing a mask or using a sword, and certainly not putting his hand on his hip. Of course, male relationships... And I've just heard that the British pole vaulter has asked for the crash mat to be removed. <laughs> of course, male relationships... Oh, and I've just heard that the British entering the diving has bashed his head on the diving board as part of his freestyle routine. <laughs> of course, male relationships in the culture of violence have been warped by all this business. The spectre of who is the hardest can poison even the closest friendship. And now we've just got time for some late news. I can, I can have Ronnie Barker. Did you hear that, Barker? I'm calling you a butler. What are you going to do about it? And it's good night from him. <laughs> At the moment, this is all having a global impact because the reason that most people here are happy to see our troops setting up for war is that despite the fact that Iraq has the fourth largest army in the world and has killed millions of people in the last ten years, they still have a sneaky feeling that your Arab is basically not that hard. You know, because, like, they wear slip-ons, don't they? <laughs> Britain, meanwhile, has sent out the SAS. This is presumably due to all the mystique which surrounds the SAS, which is strange, really, because aren't they just sort of punctual Millwall fans? <laughs> but these kind of misplaced Western assumptions about Iraqi hardness will not affect actual military planning in the Gulf. OK, men, here's the plan for Operation Desert Rat on January the 15th. The Royal Fusiliers will assemble here at 0800 hours, face the Iraqi line and shout, come on and have a go if you think you're hard enough. <laughs> yes, our men will then put on gas masks as at this point the Iraqis will, according to intelligence, cack their pants. <laughs>